Five Good Morning Grade Twelves. We are starting with Chapter Five today. In the textbook, you can go to page ninety. All right, the new chapter. In this chapter, the topic is the South African International Trade Strategy. So Chapter Five links very nicely with Chapter Four. Yeah, the two of them links together nicely. There are two essay questions in Chapter Five. And the lesson that we are going to do today, export promotion, that is the first of the essay questions in this chapter. All right. Um, last year in the final exam, they asked one of these two. It was either export promotion or import substitution. So the chances that they're going to ask any one of these two essay questions at the end of this year is very slim, all right? But nothing is guaranteed. So we're going to mark them as essay questions anyway. Right, so if we just work through the introduction, globalization, we've spoken about globalization. When you did also chapter four activities, there was one question where I asked, what is globalization? All right, so remember globalization is this movement that we have nowadays in the economies of the world, that countries are more interdependent, countries will specialize in the production that they are really good at, of the goods that they're really good at producing, and then countries will export their surpluses and import any shortages that they might have. Okay, with globalization, obviously there's been a huge increase in international trade. The volume of trade has increased greatly. And it's almost like the whole world is a global village. Near the whole world is one big international market. There's no country that can live in isolation anymore. All right, so with global globalization, obviously that requires a high degree of economic integration between countries. As I said, countries are interdependent. Yeah? Countries depend on each other. In modern economies, it is impossible for a country to be 100% self-sufficient. All right. Your consumer tastes and preferences have become very advanced. So no country has all the resources to produce every single thing that every single produ uh, consumer in that, uh, in that country might want. All right. Obviously, when we looked at Chapter 4, we spoke about demand reasons for international trade and consumer tastes and preferences was one of those reasons. Ne? Consumers will cultivate a taste for something they would like to have access to certain things. It just might not be profitable. It isn't profitable for every country to produce every single thing that every consumer wants. All right. So, obviously, there's no modern economy that can 100% satisfy all of the needs of their consumers, né? because consumers' needs, and they, they, it has evolved and they want so many different things, né? a wide variety of things. So to increase economic growth and development, governments obviously try to promote their domestic business internationally. Né? Remember, exports serve as injections. When we export goods, when we promote our businesses internationally and we can export more things. Obviously, that brings more money into the country. Yeah, it increases the markets of businesses. So businesses are able to do mass production. They're not producing just for South Africa. They're producing for the whole world. So they can make use of the advantages of mass production. Plus, then, as I said, the, the money that we earn for our exports serves as an injection into the local economy. And you will remember from Chapter 1, those injections will multiply. A small injection can multiply and create a larger change in income. So it creates income for many people in the country. All right. Now you will see in Lesson 3 of this chapter, we're going to start looking at protectionism versus free trade, right? We are all supposed to, near the World Trade Organization wants us all to move towards free trade and less, use less protectionism, okay? But not all countries are equally enthusiastic about the openness of their economies, all right? There are advantages and disadvantages involved in free trade, but there are also advantages and disadvantages in terms of protection, all right? So that we are going to look at later, okay? But one of the challenges that we face in terms of globalization and free trade is that smaller businesses, they struggle to compete with the lower prices and better quality of goods produced in other countries. All right. China specifically is mentioned here. All right. So basically, when we our textile industries, for example. Now, our textile industries in South Africa 
obviously we have minimum wages in South Africa. We have environmental laws that businesses have to abide by. So that makes the production cost of our businesses slightly higher. Now, the higher your wages, the higher your production cost. Wages makes up a large part of production cost. So in countries like China, where they don't have necessarily minimum wages, they can get away with paying their workers very little, meaning their production costs are very little. And lower production costs means that their selling prices is lower. All right. So for small South African businesses that are trying to make a living in South Africa, their prices tends to be higher than prices of countries like, for example, China, because our production costs are higher. All right. So when it comes to globalization and free trade, and we are not allowed to use protectionism anymore to protect us against things like dumping, which we will discuss later, obviously our smaller businesses will struggle to compete. Now, locally, people are going to buy at the lower prices. Now, people live on a limited income. When we go to the shops, we don't look at where the products were manufactured. We just look at the prices and the quality. And sometimes consumers will buy imported products, sometimes from China, um, because it is cheaper, and then we don't support our local businesses. And obviously our local businesses, if they don't sell anything, they're going to go out of business and people are going to lose their jobs. All right. So it's a very real threat to smaller businesses if we have to abide by free trade regulations as the World Trade Organization wants us to be. The second problem is that harmful or undesirable goods and people travel across borders without being detected. All right. If we think, for example, in terms of drugs, illegal drugs, it enters the country through our borders um, and it's not supposed to happen. All right. We don't find them. Sometimes we find them, but we don't always find them. So there's undesirable things, harmful products that comes across our borders that are being imported from other countries and we don't always find them. All right. And then last point, there are even countries that campaign actively for free trade. So even those countries that want to be involved in free trade, they find reasons to put restrictions on the flow of goods. We will talk about, and I'm saying this in inverted commas, you can't see me, but we're going to talk about new forms of protection, eh? the, the reasons that other countries use to not trade. And it's normally developed countries that think up reasons to not trade with developing countries. But we are going to work through that as we go through this chapter. All right. Now, in terms of international trade strategies, we distinguish between two different kinds of strategies. We have outward-looking strategies and inward-looking strategies. Our outward-looking policy, the one that we are going to look at, is called export promotion. Right, outward-looking policy is a positive strategy. Now we promote something, we encourage something, we encourage exports. Inward-looking policies are like, for example, import substitution and protectionism. All right, that is all about discouraging something. All right, now you can think for yourself, you as a teenager, sometimes positive strategies just works better than negative strategies. Now, positive reinforcement works better than trying to discourage you from doing something. If your parents, for example, now say during the lockdown that um, you, they are going to punish you if you don't do the dishes. Now they're going to take your phone away. Well, you'll be happy because then you don't have to do your eco homework. But if they want to punish you, they're going to say, ne? an inward looking policy would be either you wash the dishes or I'm going to take your phone away and I'm not going to allow you to watch TV. They are discouraging ne? negative strategies. Whereas a positive strategy would be, yo, my darling, if you are willing to wash the dishes for mommy tonight, I will buy you one gig of data. Yeah, that will be an outward-looking policy and encouraging a positive strategy. Generally speaking, positive strategies works better than negative strategies. All right. But in terms of our international trade strategy, we have both. All right. We have an outward-looking policy called export promotion. And we have an inward-looking strategy that is called import substitution. And those are your two essay questions. All right. So the first essay question that we are going to do today is called export promotion. All right. So everything here is important. Okay. Now, when they ask these essay questions, the way that they've been asking them lately now is that they are just going to say, critically analyze export promotion 
as an international trade strategy. All right, you will see if you page through this work, there's a lot that you can write for export promotion. All right, so if it's an open essay like that, it is really, really easy. So you can do reasons for export promotion, you can do the advantages, you can do the disadvantages, you can do the forms of export promotion. There's a lot of stuff that you can write. Just remember, in any essay question, there's a maximum of eight marks for headings and listing. So you cannot write more than eight headings. You can, but they are not going to mark more than eight headings. There are, however, if you write like 20 headings, they will mark the first eight headings with whatever discussions underneath that, but then they will follow. They won't give any more single marks for headings, but they will still mark your discussions. Né? But maximum of eight single marks. Okay. So if we look at export promotion, if they ask this as an essay question, obviously your definition is going to be the introduction to your essay. All right. What is export promotion? Export promotion is any measures taken by the government to increase the quantity and variety of goods and services that we are exported. All right. So very important when we make use of export promotion, it is not just about encouraging the volume of exports. It is not just about exporting more but it is also about exporting different kinds of things. All right, so to increase the variety of things that we export. We don't just export gold and minerals or whatever. We need to find other things that we can also export to other countries. So increase the quantity and the variety of things that we export. Right, if we look at the reasons for export promotion, first of all, we want to achieve export-driven economic growth. I have already said, remember exports, the money that we receive, the income that we receive for our exports serves as an injection into the country. And with that injection through the multiplier process, that small injection is going to be cause a bigger increase in income and spending and production. And when there's an income in production, that is where economic growth is going to come from. Okay, remember I always say to you, it's always better spending other people's money. All right, so when we are earning money from exports, it is extra money that is being coming into our circular flow. It is more money that is now available in our country to develop our country, to create more businesses in our country, to create more jobs for our people in our country. All right, so it can create that injection that we need to stimulate our economic growth. All right, exports also improve the productive capacity of the country. As I said, all of this money coming into the country, there's injections into the country. We can increase the productive capacity of the country if we use that money to establish new industries. All right. With export promotion, obviously the idea is that we export more. But in order to export more, we need to produce more first. And in order to produce more, obviously sometimes we are going to establish more industries. All right. So more industries means there are more businesses that is busy producing in the country and therefore our productive capacity or economic growth can also increase. Right, export markets then are also much bigger. Okay, So as I said, we are not producing anymore just for the local market. We are not just producing for the shops in Krugersdorp. We are not just producing for the shops in Gauteng. We are not just producing for South Africa. We are producing for the whole world. So the whole world becomes our market now. And remember we said mass production can only be done if you know that the market is big enough. You can't produce gazillions of items unless you know that your market is really big. You need to be able to sell what you produce. So because we are exporting now and we're increasing the volume of our exports, obviously we need to start doing mass production. Eh? Production on large scale, mass production. We need to get involved in mass production. And that we also increase job creation. Eh? When we want to produce more, we need to employ more production factors. And one of those production factors is labor. All right, so if we're employing more people, obviously the unemployment rate can also decrease and living standards of people earning income now can also increase. Right, also through mass production, it leads to lower prices. Okay, if you think back to grade 11 last year, when we looked at production cost, all right, and I will refresh your memory regarding production cost when we go to chapter six, okay, we're going to do all those production costs again. 
But mass production means that our average cost, unit cost, average cost decreases because we are using our fixed factors more efficiently. All right. So when we do mass production, it also leads to lower average cost and lower average cost means lower prices. All right. So because we do mass production and our costs are lower, we can also reduce our selling prices, which makes us more competitive internationally. Remember in chapter four, we said other countries are only going to buy from us if they can't get it elsewhere cheaper. So if we give them a good deal, low, a good quality product at a low price, more countries will be willing to buy from us. Okay? That improves our international competitiveness. It will also benefit the local people because local people will also benefit from these lower prices. All right. The first step towards export-driven growth, as I mentioned before, is to implement policies also to encourage the establishment of new industries. As I said, if we want to increase our exports, we need to increase our production. So we also need to increase our businesses. Now, how many businesses is in an industry? So we want to increase or encourage the establishment of new industries. Right, we want to improve the performance of manufacturing and service industries. Okay, obviously, we need to produce things first before we export. So we need to improve the performance of our manufacturing sector. In those factories where goods are being produced, they need to become more efficient. They need to make sure that they use the correct production methods in order to decrease their costs and also improve the quality of the products that they sell. And then lastly, we want to ensure the optimal use of our resources. Okay, so our natural resources, remember natural resources are scarce and limited. So whatever natural resources we are using, we want to use them efficiently. We need to limit any wastage. Now, the resources, remember, in a business, resources has to be bought. Your raw materials, you have to buy them, you pay for them. So if you are using resources and you are making a lot of mistakes in your factory, which you cannot sell, you have paid money for those natural resources and now you're not getting anything back when you sell them. So when we are using our natural resources, we need to use them efficiently. We need to get as much out of them as possible. Okay, we should eliminate any kind of wastage. Right, now very important also, and a big part of this essay, is the methods to you that we can use to promote our exports. So what can our government do to promote our exports? Okay, now very important. The World Trade Organization, that abbreviation, WTO, if you don't know, you need to write it down. That stands for World Trade Organization. All right. The World Trade Organization basically is the organization that controls international trade. Now, they decide what is fair and what is not fair. We are going to look at the World Trade Organization as an organization in detail later on in this chapter. All right. But now, because the, the, the movement now is to move towards free trade. To satisfy World Trade Organization rules and regulations, whatever incentives and subsidies we pay out to the producers in our country, it must be set up in such a way that investors will not find the domestic market more lucrative than the foreign market or the other way around. Okay? It's called the neutrality condition. So whatever incentives our government pays to our domestic producers it must be done in such a way that it is fair, basically. Yeah? So that it's not a case that when a person has to invest money, that an investor is going to find our domestic market more profitable, basically, than the foreign market as a result of the incentive or the subsidy paid by the government. All right. Other reasons, it's got nothing to do with us, right? But we can't pay the incentive and the subsidy and then investors use these incentives or subsidies to, to use that as a reason to invest in one particular country and not another country. So they, they're not going to invest in one country because subsidies are given and not in another country because there are no subsidies in that country. Okay, That would be unfair. All right. Their decision must be neutral. It mustn't be based on the incentives or subsidies that is being paid out in those industries. Okay. Now, the first incentive that our government pays out is a direct subsidy. All right. Now, we look here specifically at an export subsidy. Now we want to promote exports. So a, an export subsidy is a payment that the government makes 
to a domestic producer who exports their goods to other countries. All right. Now, the reason why we call them a direct subsidy is because it involves government expenditure. All right. With a direct subsidy, physically what happens is from the budget, the government will take some money out of that budget and they will physically give money to a domestic producer who is willing to export their goods abroad. So it physically involves government expenditure that they have to physically budget for. Okay. Now, these direct subsidies that we are talking here, if you think back to Chapter 1 quickly, this will be a subsidy on production. All right. That is what your direct subsidy will be, a subsidy on production, a producer subsidy. It is a subsidy given to the producer to cover a part of their production cost. All right. So the reason why the government does this, if they subsidize, if you think back again quickly to Chapter 1, when we go to market prices, now when we start with factor cost, we add taxes on production, we minus subsidies on production. So your subsidies on production, your direct subsidies will decrease the basic prices, which is production cost. All right. So the payment of a subsidy to a producer means that we are reducing their production cost. And when production cost decreases, automatically their selling prices will decrease. Remember I said other countries will only buy from us if we are reasonably priced. So by reducing, paying a subsidy and reducing production costs, businesses' prices will drop and that makes us more competitive internationally. Other countries are now more likely to buy from us because our prices are now lower. All right. Just remember with a direct subsidy, it's physically paying out money. But a, a export subsidy will only be given to producers who in, whose intentions are to export what they have produced. Otherwise, it's not an export subsidy. Okay, the idea is they are giving it to domestic producers who export. We want our export industries to become more competitive, their prices to decrease. Okay, now if we look at examples of direct subsidies, firstly, they can give a cash grant, an outpayment of a cash grant offered to South African exhibitors to exhibit their products at exhibitions overseas. All right. So obviously, depending on which industry you are in, if you are a boat manufacturer, for example, a recreational boat manufacturer, I know there is some other exhibition in Florida in America, I think January or February every year. Now, if you as a producer would like to attend that exhibit, take some of your boats there to exhibit them so that people that go to the exhibition can see your boats and ask you questions and whatever, and then hopefully order from you, that obviously costs a lot of money. All right, so for our producers to go to any other country to exhibit some examples of their products, they have to physically take their products there, they themselves have to go there, it is very expensive. Now, the rand is very weak, so it's very expensive for our businesses to actually attend these exhibitions. So what the government then sometimes do is they give a cash grant so they will cover a part of your cost to attend this exhibition and to go and exhibit your stuff there. Right. The next thing, foreign trade missions to explore new markets. All right. Now, when you export, it's not as simple as, okay, I'm hoying my stuff in a crate on a boat and I'm sending it overseas. Right. If you want to export, you literally first have to find a shop on the other side that is willing to stock your product. So physically, you have to go there and you have to talk to people, you have to go and see people, and you have to convince their shops to actually order from you. All right. And that, again, costs money. All right. So when the government is involved in foreign trade missions, basically, they enter into agreements with governments of other countries that we will be allowed to export our stuff there. We are going to talk about foreign trade protocols later on in this chapter as well. Then we're going to look at some examples of agreements that our government has with governments of other countries. Right. Funds for the formation of formal export councils. Again, the export councils also assist our businesses in the exporting of their goods. And then obviously the government will fund those formal export councils, so that the businesses, it doesn't cost the businesses anything. Subsidies for training or employing personnel, right? You'll see later on in Module 3, we're going to talk about the, the skills improvement plan, SIP, okay? 
Now, not many businesses are wanting to employ unskilled people. Most businesses would like to employ skilled people who knows what they're doing, right? Very few businesses want to employ an unskilled person and then spend the money on training that person. But the government, because obviously we have an oversupply of unskilled workers, they want to encourage businesses to do this, so they will subsidize the training. Right, so any training, if you are willing as an exporting business to employ less skilled people and then pay for their training, which obviously increases your production costs, the government will subsidize that training. They don't pay for all the training, but they pay for a part of that training so that your production cost, once again, reduces. All right, if you're starting a new project, okay, where you're going to produce things to export, obviously you need to employ personnel, you need to, to employ workers from scratch, the government will subsidize. It works on a sliding scale. Okay? The more workers you are willing to employ, the bigger the subsidy is going to be. Right, funds for export market research. Okay? Market research, remember, you don't enter into any market without doing your research because it's going to cost you a bunch of money and then if you haven't done your research, you don't even know that there is no demand for your product, right? So market research is very important, but it also is very expensive. So when the government also subsidizes that research. All right, and the last thing there, product registration and foreign patent registrations. Remember, when you come up with a new product, you as the inventor of that product is entitled to register a patent right. Okay, now there's the difference. If you register your patent just in South Africa, that means that for a certain amount of time, you will be the only person in South Africa to produce that product. But unless you register a foreign patent, then in, people in other countries can just copy your design and make money off of your idea. But to register a foreign patent is excruciatingly expensive. All right. Obviously, part of this export subsidy would be that the government subsidizes, they help you with that foreign patent registration fee so that you don't have to pay that entire fee. They will cover a part of that fee, which then means that you have the sole right in the world to produce that particular product for a certain amount of time. So obviously, we can export. Né? If we are the only people producing it, other countries will have to buy from us and that will automatically increase our exports. Right. The purpose of a direct subsidy, as I explained in the beginning, is to reduce production cost. Now, the whole idea is they give us this export subsidy so that our production costs are lower. If our production costs are lower, our selling prices will also decrease and that makes us more competitive. Now, competitiveness means low prices, good quality. So if our production costs are lower, our selling prices can decrease also. And that means we can be more competitive in comparison to other countries. All right. And then lastly, there to explore and establish the overseas market. Now, a lot of those um, examples of direct subsidies was about finding those overseas markets, convincing them to buy from us. Right. The second form of subsidy that we're going to look at is an indirect subsidy. Okay. Now, the difference between the two with a direct subsidy there's government expenditure. Now, remember I said government takes money out of the budget. They take some of that budget money and they give it to businesses that are willing to export. In the case of an indirect subsidy, there's no government expenditure. All right. In this case, government helps companies by allowing them not to pay certain taxes. So the government is basically sacrificing income. So an indirect subsidy, instead of the business paying taxes, which serves as government revenue, and then the government takes that government revenue, the taxes, and they give it back to the business as a subsidy, instead of doing that, they say to the businesses, export businesses, right, you don't have to pay certain taxes, but then because you don't pay those taxes, it has the same effect. It decreases production cost. If you don't have to pay taxes, as a business, there's something you are not paying. That means your production cost will be lower. If your production cost is lower, the prices can be lower as well. So not having to pay certain taxes has exactly the same effect as a direct subsidy. It lowers production cost, it lowers their prices, and it makes them more 
competitive in the international market. All right. Now, indirect subsidies can be dig, done in the form of a tax rebate. A tax rebate means that a certain part of your production cost is subtracted from the tax that you have to pay. All right, in our tax system, our tax scales also allow for rebates for individuals, for example. Eh? So the tax rebate means that they, they, they identify a certain part of your production cost. Once you have calculated as a company, you have calculated your net profit, and on that net profit, you have to pay your company's tax, right? Now, when you have calculated the tax that you are supposed to pay, you take a part of your production cost and you subtract that from the tax that has to be paid. So you end up paying less tax than what you were supposed to because you are minusing a part of your production cost from the tax. So there's a certain part of your tax that you don't pay. You pay less tax than what you were supposed to. All right. And because you are paying less tax, your production cost is lower. Now, the one condition in terms of the tax rebate for exporters is that that part of your production cost that you are subtracting from your tax, it must be directly related to your export activities. So you cannot, if you are a local company and you sell some of your stuff locally and you export some of the stuff, you cannot go and subtract cost of production of things that you sold locally. That's not the idea. The cost of production that you are subtracting, it must be directly related to your export activities. So you can subtract a part of the production cost of exported goods and services from those taxes. Now, it only applies to the things that you export. Right. The second option is a refund of your import tariffs. Okay. Now, sometimes businesses import raw materials or they import machinery that they need to use in their production process. And anything or certain things that we import from other countries, we also pay an import tariff, a customs duty. All right, so if a business uses imported goods or technology that they paid import tariffs on when they imported those items, Obviously, now it increases their production cost because now you must pay for the production, the cost of the good that you are importing, plus you must pay the customs duty. So now instead, to promote exports, yeah, to make their production cost lower, the government will allow you or they will refund you those taxes that was included in the production of your exported goods. So if you have imported raw materials and you've paid customs duties on those imported goods, when you export them, the government is going to give you your import taxes back. So you end up not paying import tariffs, again, as long as what you are importing is directly related to the production of the goods that you will be exporting. All right, they're not going to refund import tariffs that you paid when you produce things and you sell them locally. You will only be refunded your customs duty if you are exporting the goods that you are producing. It is an export subsidy. We are trying to promote exports. All right. The next one is your tax concessions. All right. So, again, they will allow you to not pay tax or reduce the taxes that you have to pay on any profit that you earned from exports. All right. Or capital invested to produce your exported goods. Okay. So, remember, businesses have to pay taxes on their profit, but the government can allow you to not pay tax at all or you pay a reduced rate of tax on any profit that you have made from exports. All right. So again, it's reducing the amount of taxes that you have to pay. Okay. Now, the reason I said already that we call them indirect subsidies is because it does not result in government expenditure. All right. It is the government sacrificing income. You are not paying taxes. Okay. The government allows you to not pay taxes. There's no physical government expenditure. It decreases the government revenue because you don't pay certain taxes. Okay. The last form of export promotion or method that they can use to encourage exports is incentives. All right. So incentives and support is given to companies 
to encourage them to export a larger portion of their production. And again, the purpose of the incentive is to encourage exports by giving financial assistance. Okay, they're helping these businesses financially so that they can export a larger chunk of what they have produced. All right. This assistance enables them to compete in the international markets. Okay, so it makes them again more competitive. It enables them to be possible, makes it possible for them to be actively involved in the international markets. All right. So it includes information, for example, on the export markets. As I said, research. Yeah, research has to be done. If you don't do your research, you can make a big mistake if you want to enter a market and there's no demand for your product. All right. So from the government side, they provide you information on export markets. They do research with regards to new markets. Okay, so on your behalf, the government will do the research so that you don't have to pay for that research. Okay, concessions on transport charges. Okay, for example, from the interior to the harbors. So if your factory is in Krugersdorp, obviously if you want to export your product, you first need to export your products on a truck or a train to the harbor and from the harbor onto the ship to be exported, right? So the government can give you a concession in terms of transport charges. So they will decrease what you pay for transporting your stuff on a truck or transporting it in a train or whatever to decrease your transport costs, which also will decrease your production cost. All right, export credit guarantees. Right, now to export your products, it is a risk, okay? So you put your product, a million gadgets, you put it on a ship and it goes to America, right? Normally, when we export stuff, it is cash on delivery. So you don't physically get paid until your gadgets gets to the other side. It gets cleared from customs. The person that ordered it receives it. And when he's inspected and he's happy with his order, then only does he pay you. Now, when that person on the other side doesn't pay, it is not like you can just quickly drive to his house yeah, and go and take your money. It is in a completely different country. All right. So what the government do from their side to, to relieve some of the risk involved in an export transaction, the government issue you, issues you with an export credit guarantee. So the government basically guarantees you that if you export and your stuff gets to the other side and that person does not pay you, the government will make sure that you get paid and they will take the responsibility to get the money out of that person. So you as the exporter is basically guaranteed that you will receive payment for the stuff that you have exported. Okay, that just makes it safer. Right, publicity. Okay, obviously advertising of some sort. Yeah, the government promotes your business in other countries. The establishment of trade missions, as I said, we are going to discuss this in detail later on in this chapter. A trade mission is when our government enters into an agreement with a government of another country or more than one other country, where between the countries they decide that they will have free trade, you know, that we will be allowed to export certain items to them and there will be no customs duties or quotas or whatever on their side. And they are allowed to export stuff to us without any kind of restriction. Okay, so it's agreements that governments into, enter into with each other. But we will look at a couple of them in detail later on in this chapter. All right. The last thing is the government can establish export processing zones. Okay, it is called, I can't remember now, we're going to do this in module three. All right. We are going to look, it's called an IDZ, okay, industrial development zone. Where if you are if you wanting to, if you're willing to to establish your business inside of these IDZs near the export processing zone, then the government will give you certain advantages. Okay, like for example, the exemption of that for stuff that you buy locally, no customs duties for anything that you have to import from other countries. You get it get a designated customs official, so your stuff gets cleared through customs very quickly. Okay, there's a lot of advantages. In, um, the, the four businesses that is given to them by the government if they are willing to establish their business inside of an IDZ. All right. But again, we are going to discuss that in detail in, in um, Module 3 later on in this year. All right. If we look at the advantages of export promotion, now, as I said, both in, export promotion and import substitution have advantages and disadvantages. All right. 
So it's very important then that we just look at both, right? So the first advantage of export promotion that I mentioned earlier as well is that your foreign markets are much bigger than domestic markets. Now, as I said earlier, we are not just producing for Krugersdorp or Gauteng or South Africa. We are now producing for the whole world. So we are able to produce larger quantities. We can only produce large quantities if we know that we can sell large quantities. If we produce 10 million of something and we're only selling in Krugersdorp, there's no way we're going to sell 10 million articles and then it's cost us money to produce them and we don't get them sold so we never get our money back. All right. So obviously when we do international trade, when we do export promotion, when we sell to other countries as well, our markets are so much bigger so it makes it safer for us to engage in mass production. And as I said now, when we look at the production cost, economies of scale is going to kick in. Okay, When we produce masses and masses of stuff, your average cost will decrease. Okay, So the price per unit is decreasing and your prices can then also decrease. All right. When you produce large quantities, you can also buy your raw materials in bulk, Okay, which also leads to discounts. All right. Any supplier, most suppliers, if you order in bulk, if you don't just order one, 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 and you order lots of something at a time, they always normally give you a discount for buying in bulk. It works out cheaper to buy your raw materials if you're buying in bulk. You can only buy in bulk if you're going to do large-scale production, though. All right. So when the markets are bigger, obviously it has this advantage that you can do mass production, you can do bulk buying of your resources. Right. The second advantage is that it creates a larger demand for labor. Okay. As I said in the beginning of this lesson, if we want to export more, we first need to produce more. All right, so if we are able to produce more, in order to produce more, we also need to employ more production factors. And as I said, one of those production factors will be labor. All right, so job creation is very important. Remember, we spoke about full employment being one of the government's goals. By promoting our exports and encouraging an increase in production in order to increase our exports, businesses will employ more people. Okay, because they need more people to produce more stuff so that we can export more. And that will obviously help the government to achieve their objective of decreasing unemployment. Right. The next advantage is that it increases competition and efficiency. All right. Now, I did mention this before, okay, in a different contest as well. When we establish new industries and when we're competing internationally, we are not just competing now with local businesses. We are competing with everybody in the world. So if we want to survive, we really have to be very good at what we are doing. All right. So because our number of competitors are increasing, if I'm literally only competing, I make cupcakes and I'm literally only competing with Ms. With Ms. Berger's cupcake business, it's easy for me, relatively easy for me to be better than her, Right. But if now there's 10 new industries being established, now I have to compete with 10 new people as well. And then I go outside of Krugersdorp, I go and compete in Gauteng. Now I have to compete with 100 other cupcake makers. If I go into the world, I have to compete with thousands of other cupcake makers. And remember, other countries are only going to buy from us if we are really good, our quality of our products are good, and our prices are reasonable. All right. So as competition increases, because there's more and more and more competition, me as a producer are going to be forced to become more efficient. I'm going to have to find new production methods. I'm going to have to find ways of improving my quality and to decrease my prices. All right. Obviously, also when there's increased competition, there's a bigger variety for consumers to choose from. All right. So for our Consumers in this country, they don't only have my cupcakes to choose from. They now have cupcakes from around the world to choose from. There's more variety for them to choose from, which will increase their living standards. And because I'm becoming more efficient, yeah, as there's more competition, I become better at what I do. I have to become better. It's either get better or go bankrupt, right? So if I do what I can and I improve my production methods and I become innovative and I start being more productive and whatever, more efficient, and my costs will decrease. Not only am I more competitive internationally now, 
but local consumers will also benefit from lower prices. Now, I'm not just selling at a lower price internationally. Locally, my, my consumers will also benefit because my production cost is lower and my prices is lower. So it becomes more affordable for them to buy from me also. Second last advantage is that it earns foreign currency. Okay, we've had this discussion as well. When we export our products, that serves as an injection into the circular flow. And through the multiplier process, it also increases income production and spending. All right, so we earn a lot of extra foreign currency. It brings money into our country, which will obviously then, through the multiplier process, spread through different sectors and increase econo the economic, economic growth and income and spending in our economy as a total. As well, when people have to pay for our exports, if we link it to the exchange rates as well, if they are paying us for our exports, that means the demand for RAND will increase in the foreign markets. More people will be wanting to buy RAND. And if a lot of people are buying RAND in order to pay for our exports, that will make the RAND more scarce and the RAND will appreciate. All right, so it's an extra advantage also that it will lead to an appreciation of the RAND. All right. The last advantage, improved balance of payments. Okay, remember on the balance of payments, exports are positive entries, imports are negative entries. So when there's an increase in exports, it means more money is coming into the country. And if we have a deficit, it could possibly eliminate that deficit because extra money is coming into the country. The last thing that we're going to look at for export promotion is the disadvantages. Now, there's always advantages, there's always disadvantages. The first disadvantage is that prices are distorted. Okay, now I want you to listen to me. All right, there's a lot of people out there. Now, it's artificial. The low prices, the, the prices that we are seeing is not real. The prices of exported products is less than what it was supposed to be because of that export subsidy. Prices did not come down because those businesses became more efficient or they found a better way of doing stuff. The only reason their production cost is down is because the government paid them a subsidy. All right. So the subsidies that they receive makes it look like their production cost is lower. It makes it look that their prices are lower. But in actual fact, it is not. All right. The price is not a true reflection of the cost of production. Okay, and just remember, fake things don't last. All right. If, for example, girls, ne, you put in a weave or an artificial, the artificial hair, ne, braiding or something in your hair, it is not real hair. At some point, it falls out. False nails. Lots of people stick false nails on their nails. At some point, it falls off. It doesn't last. Fake eyelashes, they fall off. They don't last. Okay? It is not a true reflection of the industry. Their cost of production is lower. It's a fake lower production cost because the government gave them money to decrease their production cost. It doesn't mean that they are now becoming more efficient. They're not becoming better at what they're doing. It looks like they are. It looks like their production cost is cheaper. It looks like their prices dropped. In the meantime, it is not. No, it is a fake low price because the government is forcing that price down. And in a market system, obviously, prices play an important role in determining demand and supply. So we are messing with demand and supply when we have a fake price. Second problem is that foreign producers are discouraged. All right. So if in South Africa now we pay lo lower subsidies, then we have subsidies, okay? Foreigners are not going to be wanting to sell their products in our country because we are faking our low price. The government gives our producer a subsidy, so it looks like our low price is cheaper, all right? So the price is lower. It looks like the price is lower. As I said, when the consumers go to the shops, they always buy the cheapest product, all right? So they're not going to think, oh, the South African product is cheaper because the government is subsidizing them. I feel sorry for the, the imported stuff. Let me buy the imported stuff. Nobody does that ever, all right? They look at the price. The price that looks lower, that is what the consumer is going to buy. All right. And then foreign businesses, they know this. Okay? If they know, for example, that 
milk is subsidized in South Africa. They know if they don't get a subsidy, they can't compete with the local producers and then they're simply not going to export their stuff to us. And then that deprives our local consumers of having a variety of things to choose from. If this happens and if foreign businesses don't export to us, we will be limited in our shops to what our local producers are willing to supply, okay, what they can sell to us. We will not have the benefit of other goods coming in from other countries and having a wider variety to choose from because the, um, international businesses will know that we are being subsidized. They cannot compete with our lower prices if they are not subsidized. All right. Next problem. This is an easy one, right? If I slap you, okay, maybe not as a teacher, right? But if I wasn't a teacher, I was your friend and I slapped you, what were you going to do? I hope all of you said you're going to slap me back, right? And that is exactly what happens in terms of international trade. So if we subsidize our products to make it look like our prices are cheaper and we export to the other country, the other country is going to say, uh-uh, if you're going to subsidize your stuff to get a fake lower price, now our goods can't compete, uh-uh, when you bring your fake low prices into my country, I am going to levy a tax. So when we export to other countries, then they are going to impose quotas. So in other words, they're only going to get, uh, like, allow a few of our exports into their limited number of our exports into their country, or they're going to tax the crap out of our stuff. And then our fake low price is higher as a result of the tax. Now they retaliate. Okay, if we subsidize, it means that we are pretending that we have this low price. If their industries are not being subsidized, they can't compete with our lower prices, our fake lower prices as a result of the subsidy. And therefore, they are going to protect their industries by imposing a quota or a tariff. And now they are pushing our fake low prices higher so that in their country, nobody wants to buy our product because now it looks more expensive because of a tax. Né? We do something, they retaliate. They have to protect their industries as well. Okay. Next problem is that we are keeping our businesses inefficient. All right. We are not forcing them to become better. All right. Because we give them this incentive, because we give them this subsidy, we are fake forcing their production costs down. It looks like they, their production costs are lower, but their production cost is lower only because of the subsidy that they receive. It is not as a result of finding a better production method. It is not as a result of them becoming more efficient. It is only because of that subsidy. So we are basically allowing them to be inefficient. Now we are babying them. As long as what we give them the subsidy, there's no reason for them to try and improve what they do. All right. There's no reason for them to become better. And then what happens nine out of 10 times, if the government withdraws these incentives, because also we can't keep paying export subsidies. Now we protect new industries. We help new industries until they become established. At some point, we're going to withdraw this incentive. And then we're no longer going to give them an export subsidy. And then they cannot survive on their own because they never learned how to get better. All right. Next problem, it can be seen as dumping. All right. Now, any kind of dumping is against the provisions of the World Trade Organization. All right. Please, you're an economic student. Know the economic definition of what is dumping. It has nothing to do with trash. Yeah, the rubbish that we put out once a week. It's got nothing to do with that. Okay. Dumping occurs when a business sells its product in a foreign country at a lower price than it asks in the domestic market. So dumping would be, for example, if we sell pasta in our country for 15 rand for 500 grams, but we sell the same pasta in Zimbabwe at 5 rand for 500 grams. A domestic business sells their product in a different country at a price that is lower than what they ask in their own country. And sometimes the, the asking price in the foreign country is even lower than their production cost. All right. The only reason that people do this is to gain market share and push local producers out of the market. All right. 
if, for example, let's say in South Africa, we sell milk. All right, in South Africa, we sell the milk for, let's make it easy, 10 rand a litre in South Africa. Right, but now because milk is subsidised, which it is, all right, our milk farmers produce too much. Okay, there, there, there's an oversupply of milk on our market. So in our market, they sell it for 10 rand, but to get rid of all the surpluses that they have produced, they sell our surplus milk in Zimbabwe next door, but they only sell it for 5 rand a litre. Now, in our country, the reason why we have the surplus is because of the export subsidy. Yeah, we are receiving a subsidy, so the production cost is cheaper, so the supply increases. Now, there's a surplus. All right. To get rid of the surplus, to get some money in return for the goods that they're now selling, they sell it at five rand, lower than their production cost, lower than what would sell it for in South Africa. In Zimbabwe, their milk farmers are not being subsidized, so their prices are higher. Okay, the local Zimbabwean milk sellers, they sell it for 10 rand a litre. All the consumers, the consumers are, 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 um, are poor, ne? they want to buy the cheapest thing possible. So all of them now buy the South African milk. Okay, the Zimbabwean milk farmers, what's going to happen to them? They sell no milk, they go out of business, an entire milk industry is lost. All right, so any kind of dumping, anything that can be seen as dumping is against the provisions of the World Trade Organization because businesses do this to push local producers out of the market, to capture that market share, and then to make excessive profits at the expense of local producers. That leads to unfair trade. Now, that is not fair. Okay. The last disadvantage is that it leads to protection of labor-intensive industries. All right. So you, the developed countries, normally, they protect those industries in which developing countries actually have a comparative advantage. So developed countries already, they have so many advantages in terms of international trade. Now they use export subsidies to give their industries an advantage, but it's actually an industry where developing countries have a comparative advantage. So the developed countries don't allow the developing countries to keep their advantage, they take that advantage away from them by subsidizing their industries. And remember, in order to subsidize an industry, the government needs money. Developed countries, governments, they've got money. Developing countries, governments don't have money. So in developing countries, the governments cannot afford to subsidize their industries. If they have a comparative advantage, it is because they are good at what they do and they've got good production methods or whatever they are more efficient. Now the developed countries go and pay a subsidy because they can, they can afford to, and now developing countries struggle to compete against the developed countries, where in the meantime the developing country is the one with a comparative advantage that the developed country's government now takes away because they want to gain that industry. It is unfair. All right. That's it for today. Now, this is, as I said, a possible essay question. So make sure that you study this very, very well.